Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. There is so much wisdom in the book of Psalms. No matter what Psalm you pick up and begin to read, you will find something that will impact your life. It will cause you to think of something differently, for you to behave differently, and draw closer to the Lord. The Psalms are powerful writings in order to bring about a godly change in our life. And through the book of Psalms, we learn how to worship God properly. Take out your Bible and look with me to just that, the book of Psalms and Psalm number 7. Now, we saw a few weeks ago that David, he had disobeyed God, and because of his disobedience, he was suffering. But nevertheless, in the midst of sin, his own sin, David turned to God. And when he was suffering because of his own actions, he still beseeched God for assistance. Now, we learn a principle in several different places in the scripture. And we call it in Hebrew, tau ve homer. It means literally light and, and heavy. And the, the meaning is this. If you would do this in a moderately difficult situation, what's this? Pray. How much more so would one pray in a very difficult situation? So the principle is this. If we pray when we're guilty for God's to help, and if we believe that God will turn to us in forgiveness and in mercy, and that God will forgive and help us in the midst of our disobedience to bring us to repentance and to bring us to obedience, and nevertheless extend to us His grace, how much more so should we expect that one true God, a merciful God, a gracious God, a forgiving God, how much more so can we expect for God to behave in our behalf when we are innocent, when we are suffering, not due to our sin, but because of persecution, because of the wickedness of others. And that's what we learn from David in this psalm. So look with me. Again, this psalm has what we've learned to call an inscription to give us some insight on how to understand the context. Now, let me say that in this seventh psalm, there are several things that are confusing. When I say confusing, I mean that we could interpret it one way or another. From the text, from the grammar, it's not clear. And secondly, there is some vocabulary that we're just simply not sure how to understand it. And also, we'll see this in the first verse, there is a reference in the rabbinical authorities also, the, the most common Christian commentators, they see things differently, how to understand several of these references. So we're going to go through this the best we can, looking at the text carefully and prayerfully for God to help us understand his revelation. So let's begin Psalm number 7. And I'm going to be looking at the first verse in Hebrew, the inscription, probably one verse in front of 
years meaning before verse 1 is this inscription and we read here the first word is shigayon and most of the christian commentators they see this as a word that speaks of intense medication that david is is really going before god pondering things examining himself looking at the situation not just carelessly spouting off to god with some requests but reviewing things in a most careful manner now others will say that this has to do with an instrument and still others will say that david is speaking about something that is unfair that's happening to him so however you choose to understand this we read that this was by david this prayer of meditation this injustice that he was was suffering or the instrument that he was thinking about for this this to be accompanied with when it's chanted then we see the next phrase a share shar le adonai which means which he sung to the lord now this word for singing can also mean to recite poetry so poetry is simply meaning a psalm so david wrote this he comprised these words in order to bear them to god to lift them up before the lord and what was the purpose for doing so well we keep reading it says al divre kush ben yamini now almost without exception the rabbinical commentators understand that this is when king saul began to persecute david for no reason simply because saul knew that he had disobeyed god that god was turning away from him and lifting up david and because of that saul wanted to destroy david it wasn't so much about david david actually and we all know this was a blessing to Saul he assisted Saul he was there to be a positive influence but Saul rejected that and Saul would not humble himself and turn over his kingship to God's choice and God chose David because of Saul's rebelliousness that Saul would not trust in the Lord. He would not respond in obedience to the revelation of God. Now, others will say, and they give a, another instant in the scripture concerning uh, one that was against David. And others simply see this as something that we don't have any firsthand biblical knowledge of, but it speaks about one who was against David david and against him for no just cause he was simply persecuting him and not only was this one this one called kush the son of yemeni but also he he caused others to join with him in persecuting david now verse 2 in the hebrew verse 1 in english david begins by affirming affirming his faith he says the lord my god and he uses that unique four letter word for god yud hey vav hey how we normally translate it is the word the lord and david is affirming this god a transcendent god a god without any type of limitations that this is and then he says elohai my god he continues and writes in you i have taken refuge meaning this david is not looking to other sources or means or individuals to help him david realizes that only god truly is the solution to his problem doesn't matter who the enemy may be 
There may be a variety of enemies. These enemies may, may come together in unity against the Son of God, the daughter of God, the believer. But God is greater. So David says, in you, and that's what's emphatic, in you I have taken shelter. And this word for taking shelter implies a trusting. It implies a, a faith. Continue on. David has confidence, and he, he, he says to God, Save me from all my persecutors. It's now in the plural. And he uses a different word for deliver me. And this word of deliverance means I'm unable and if I'm going to find deliverance, if I'm going to find this salvation, if I'm going to find a, a situation whereby my enemies are defeated, it can only come, only you can deliver that, only you can make that a reality. Next verse, three in Hebrew, two in English. If God doesn't, and this is not a, a lacking of faith, it simply says, if there's no deliverance, this is where it is going to happen to me. This is going to be the outcome. He says, lest he will tear my soul as a lion. Now, I translate it, my soul, it's the word nafshi. But, but it's speaking about the very essence, his life, what he is. What he tells us is this, if God doesn't move in this situation, David's saying, I'm coming to an end in everything. The very essence of who I am, what I have, what I'm called to, all of that is going to come to an end. David's terminology shows the seriousness of this. This is truly a matter of life and death. And he goes on, the next word is the word porech, which means, here again in preparing that, we see that Rashi says it has to do with being broken. Broken beyond repair. So he says this enemy, those who are persecuting him, they are breaking David down and there is no other one that is his matzil. Matzil? We use that in, in modern Hebrew for a lifeguard. It is a deliverer. It is one who rescues. And again and again, David is saying, there's no one else God. The, the populace has joined with my enemy. He's alone. David feels very much alone. And that only God can can deliver him. Verse 4, verse 3 in Hebrew. The Lord my God, that same phrase that we saw at the beginning of, of verse 2 in the Hebrew. O Lord my God. And David's saying something now. He's confessing. He is giving us insight on what the situation is that he is, we would say in Hebrew, chaf me patient, meaning he's innocent. He hasn't done the things that apparently that he's being accused of. He is not disloyal. And if this was in regard to Saul, we know. David was not an enemy of Saul. David's motto was, I will not rise up against the Lord's anointed. So we read here and he confesses this. He says, O Lord, my God. If I have done this, meaning if I have done what I'm accused of, and if there is any evilness, wickedness, avil in my hands. David says, if I have, have done any of which they are saying about me, then he says, if I have, and it's word for recompense. It's a, a word of payback. If this is in regard to Saul, Saul was not kind to, to David. We know that, that he, he threw a spear at David. 
He had soldiers pursue David. And David is saying, I'm not paying back. I have not done anything against the one. And he says here, I have not paid back to one who was peaceful with me evil. David says, I haven't done anything, but I've certainly not come against and done that which is bad to someone who was at peace with me. And I have not plundered, I have not taken away from, from my, my enemy uh, without cause. I've done it for no reason. David is saying over and over, what I'm being accused of, I'm innocent of. I have not done what they've said, meaning turning evil on a person who has done good. He says, I haven't done this. I am not someone that has behaved in the way that I'm being accused. Therefore, he says, as we continue on in verse 6, verse 5 in English, my enemy, he will pursue my life. And it could be thought of, of this way. If I'm guilty of these things, then let my enemy pursue my life. Let him overtake, meaning overtake me, and let him trample my life to the ground. And my honor, let it be brought low to dust. Then he says, Selah which most see as a word of, of great emotion. No one knows for sure. But David is saying, if in any way I'm guilty, then let my enemy be successful in destroying my life, returning me to dust, bringing me down in defeat. David is innocent. And what we should glean from that is simply, there are times indeed when you have done the right thing, but people return evil. And what's happening here is that David is being accused of something which they are the ones that are actually doing. David hasn't done them evil, but they're doing evil to him. And they're blaming him for it. So David is speaking, and notice what he says. Now we're ready for verse 7 in Hebrew, verse 6 in English. He says, rise up, O Lord. David has confessed. He has said that he's innocent. He says, if he's not innocent, then let that enemy be successful in destroying me and taking my life. But because he is innocent, he says, O Lord, Rise up in your anger and be lifted up. Now, here's one of the examples on how this next sentence concludes where there's a difference of opinion and we really grammatically cannot be certain how it should be translated. In Jewish translations, and when we look at the commentators of the rabbis for this passage, they would render it this way. O Lord, rise up in your anger and be lifted up in wrath. And this would be the wrath of God. And then he says, implying upon my enemy. Now, I believe that the rabbis are right here because if you look at parallelism, you see the word be'apecha. Apecha is in your anger. And then secondly, when we look, it says rise up, which is parallel to, to rise up. We have the word kuma and hinase, be lifted up. And then we have the word be'avrot, which is wrath. It has that same particle that the word for anger had in the first part of this verse it's in the same form and in the sense that it uh, uh, the particles in the same form and then we have the word for enemies now this word for enemy 
implies the, in my opinion, the one who is going to be the recipient of that wrath, the wrath of God, his anger. Most Christian commentators translate it differently. They will say something to this effect, rise up, O Lord, in your anger and be lifted up. And the implication is against the, the fearless behavior, the wrathful behavior of my enemy. So we have uh, two very different ways of understanding it. Continue on. We read here in the second part of verse 7. Ve'ura elai, be stirred up. It's another synonym for moving, raising up, but this time it's being stirred up unto me, the judgment that you have commanded. And what David is most likely talking about here is this. God makes promises in his word. And therefore, because God has commanded us do these things and don't do those things, and when we do the things God says to do and when we don't do the things he says not to do, we can expect judgment, a reward, a blessing. And this is what David is seeking. David is saying, I'm innocent. I've done the right thing. I've behaved properly. Therefore, God, I want you to be stirred up. I want you to move and bring about the judgment. The judgment, and this is like the verdict. This is the outcome which you have commanded for. The implication is those who have behaved in obedience. Verse verse 8. Again, verse 7 in English, verse 8 in Hebrew. We have the word va'adat leumim. Now, leumim is a word for nations. The word here, va'ada or va'ad, is a word for a committee, a board, some group. And he speaks here, basically, some would translate it as a word, uh, Ada meaning congregation, but it's really va, va, va'ad. It says here, and the the group of the nations surround you. Now I believe that this is in opposition. So the nations, the the federation of nations, it's like the United Nations is what we're we're referring to a group of nations. They surround you. And unto it be lifted up. And he says, shuva. Shuva means turn. And in this case, it's meaning turn against. Turn against the world. Now, some have said that this psalm also speaks appropriately in regard to Messiah. Messiah has has done everything right. In its original context, it's about David. But we can learn from the life of David about the Messiah. And we see that the nations, all the nations, are going to turn against Messiah. The purposes of Messiah in his desire to redeem Israel. So here, when we look at it, he says, turn, turn against and do what? O Lord or the Lord, he will judge the peoples. So here we have God, and David is saying, bring judgment upon the nations, upon the peoples. Why? Because they stand in opposition to your purposes. That's what David was about. David wanted to be a king that carried out the purpose, the will, the objectives of God. And he's finding as he moved towards this, there is great and greater and greater opposition towards him. Now look at the last part of verse verse 9, the last part of verse 8 in English. He says, judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness. And according to, and this would be the word for innocence, my innocence, 
place upon me. So David is seeking this, this judgment that will be his vindication. And this is an important, important principle to remember. Sometimes we hear the term judgment and we always think of condemnation. That's just one part of it. We've all heard the expression, the, the other side of the coin. So when we look at judgment, there's judgment as in condemnation for those who are in opposition to God. But there's also, also the other side of the coin, which is vindication for those who are with God, obedient in a covenantal relationship, wanting the things and serving the things that, that God wants to bring about. So he says here, according to my justice and according to my innocence, let it be upon me. Verse 10 in Hebrew, 9 in English, Yigmar na ro, or the ra rashi'im. Let it come to an end, please, the evil of the wicked. And let the righteous one be established. Now, that's what God's going to do in the last days. He is going to move, and as it says here, look carefully at this word, the word yigmar, to bring to an end. Those who are in opposition will meet their end. And what's their end? Well, it's not that just vanish and no more. Their end is eternal condemnation, everlasting punishment. So don't uh, understand this word meaning an end no more, but simply what their just end is going to be. So it's a term of, of supplication, this word na, which can be translated please. It's a beseeching. He says, let come to an end the evilness of the wickedness, but let the righteous one be established. And then look at the end of that verse, verse 9 in English, verse 10 in English. U vochen livbot uklayot Elohim sadik. Now, according to Judaism, every organ has a physical purpose, a role to play in this body in a physical sense, but also that organ has a role to play in a spiritual sense. Now, one example of that is the word heart. Heart has to do with that, that organ physically that pumps blood, spiritually, where the seat of thoughts are, where the inclinations, where the cognitive, not in the brain, that's for, that's for physical decisions. But spiritual decisions are in the heart. So notice what he says here. Speaking about God who, bohen, this is the word for to test something, to act in a way that brings about a revealing, a discerning. So he says here, U vohen, check, discern hearts. This is God. He discerns the hearts and the clayote would be the word for kidneys, which also we see from a rabbinical perspective, and I think this is true and supported biblically, also has a spiritual, kidneys have a spiritual aspect. And then it's a question of Elohim Sadiq, if we're speaking about the righteous God, or if he's saying, check the hearts and the kidneys, O God of the righteous one. And you'll see that that righteous one is in tune with the will and the purpose of God. But most Christian Bibles, they have it as the righteous God. Now let's look at verse 11 or verse 10 in English. Speaking about God, and he uses the word, the word is magen, which is shield. And this is in the first person possessive. It's the word magni, 
So my shield concerning God. God is my shield, and not only is he a shield, but he's also a savior. But notice what it says, a savior of the upright in heart. When David's going through this, David is exceedingly close to the Lord. Some of the commentators say that this is at one of David's spiritual highs. He's close to God. He's obeying God. He's committed to the purposes of God. He is wise spiritually. And it's because of all of this that the enemy has turned so passionately against David and why David is under attack. So he's calling to God and affirming, God, you are my shield and you are my savior because I am upright in heart. Verse 12, 11 in English. God, and then we have the same question. The phrase here is Shofet Sadiq. Is God the judge of the righteous one or is he the righteous judge? Now, the grammar leads one way, but almost without exception. Christian Bibles go the other way. So there's two ways you can determine how you want to understand this, prayerfully, I hope. But he says, God, a righteous judge, or God, a judge of the righteous, and a God, and notice this, ve'el zo'em, zo'em has to do with a, a, a present pouring out of the wrath. And this is word, za'am is wrath, zo'em is, is wrath being displayed. And notice what he says. The God of, of a present wrath, be'koyom, every day. Now, does that mean that God's wrath falls every day? Or does it mean that God's wrath could fall? any day and we're not just speaking about this wrath in the last days that's going to consume this world and bring about the establishment of the kingdom but we're talking about a wrath that shares god's displeasure his judgment and his consuming of those who are his enemies and many of the commentators say there are expressions of that yes indeed day in and day out we see that God is displeased and we look, if we look with his perception, we can see elements of God's judgment, manifestations of his wrath. And all of this is to gather people's attention and to cause them to understand, to understand what God is about, that he is a God who will judge. We read in this verse, in lo yashuv. Now, there's a couple different ways to translate this, but I believe the best way is this. Since he will not return, meaning this, God's not going to change. This judgment is just not going to evaporate and be done away with. It's going to happen. And since it's not going to change, he says... His sword, and this would be the sword of God, is, is polished. It's, it's ready. And the bow, his bow is drawn and it is prepared. So it's speaking about the assurance that God's judgment, his wrath will come and it will not be done away with. Verse 14 in the Hebrew 13 in English. And to him, this is David's enemy. And to him, he has prepared vessels of death and fiery arrows that will function. They will act. The implication is there is going to be judgmental activity from God to justify his faithful ones, to deliver them from the enemy. Now look at verse 15 in Hebrew, 14 in English. Hine yechabel aven. For behold, we see here that, that he is going to 
work. This is God is going to work against. He's going to bring destruction on Avin. Avin is wickedness. And then he says, the, the labor which is conceived, and it bears falsehood. What God is saying is this. He's going to act in judgment. This is the same expression in the Hebrew New Testament in the book of Revelation for God getting ready to harm, to judge, to bring his wrath upon the earth. And he says why that is. Because there has been uh, the conception of, of evil deeds and what has been given birth to? Falsehood. It is in opposition to the truth. It's for the purpose of deceiving. And this is the same type of behavior that, that the Antichrist is going to function in. And it's the same type of behavior that those who were against David were, were behaving in. Verse 16 in Hebrew, 15 in English. A, a pit has been dug and it's been dug very deep. And these uh, unrighteous ones, the enemy of God's, uh, God's servants, it says the enemy will fall into the pit that he has made. So what's great about this is the very activity, the work that is being conceived, the, the falsehood that is giving birth to, all of this evilness is going to turn against the ones who have conceived it and put it into force. God's going to make a glorious change in that time of his judgment. Verse 17 in Hebrew, 16 in English. He says here, and his labor, this is the evil one, will return upon his head and upon the crown of his head. His violence will come down. And this is the word Hamas. Hamas, you hear that today and you think about a terrorist group, and that's right. But the word Hamas in, in Hebrew is a word for violent behavior. But here's the key. I believe I've shared this a few times, but it's, it's worth repeating. And that is this. There are two Hebrew words for violence. One is Hamas, the other one is Alimut. Alimut is more common. This is violent activity for the purpose, some purpose. For example, a, a person wants to steal something and the person doesn't want to give it to them and therefore that thief, he begins to hit or he shoots, or he stabs, or whatever. But the purpose is to get that, that, that thing that he wanted to steal. Had that person just surrendered it, he wouldn't have harmed him. So that type of violence is alimut. But the word Hamas is violence for the sake of violence. And why for the sake of violence? Because the objective is to see others in suffering, to see them in pain. That is a satanic expression of violence. And it says here, upon his head, let this type of violence come down. Now our last verse, verse 18 in Hebrew, 17 in English, we read that David's confident, that God will keep covenant, that God will deliver him that God has a purpose, a future purpose for David's life and that his life's not going to be cut off at that time. So he says, I will give thanks to the Lord according to his righteousness. That's one of the greatest reasons for thanking God, praising God, worshiping God, serving God, because he is righteous. And then he says, I will sing to the name of the Lord Most High. And this name has to do with character. And his character, when we understand this is poetry, and look at the hints of Hebrew poetry, we see that his character 
is related to his righteousness. So he says, I will give thanks to the Lord according to his righteousness, and I will sing unto the name of the Lord Most High. So significant that David ends this with praise and thanksgiving because we should be confident that our God is indeed a Savior. David was going through a difficult time, but nevertheless, David had a sure, a confident expectation that God's deliverance would come. And in the end, David would be in a position where you could praise God and thank God. And what's wise to do, because we don't know when David was saying this, had anything changed in his life? See, God's worthiness for thanksgiving and praise isn't just for what he has done or what he will do. Certainly, he's praiseworthy for these things. But he's also worthy of thanksgiving and praise and worship. Not just because of what he's done, but here's the key. Because of who he is. Well, I'll close with that. Until next week, shalom. From Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.